So, um, warm welcome to you all on this fireside chat with Christopher Kingdom, the CEO and founder of Adventure Box, which is a platform for creating, sharing, and also playing games. They don't require any downloads. You don't have to install anything. You can build and share directly through the browser. And Chris, obviously, warm welcome to you. Thank you. Really nice to be here. Looking forward to our discussion. Me too. And and uh, well, you and I chatted for the very first time back in November, and we hadn't met before. But I remember speaking to you for that very first time, hearing you talk about your background from building startups, from being an entrepreneur, and also now uh, obviously heavily involved in online gaming. And that talk was just so incredibly inspiring to hear you talk about the opportunities and the futures within gaming. And I remember thinking, okay, we have to get Chris in, uh, in one of our sessions. We just have to do some sort of event with him. So it's, it's great to see that, uh, that here we are. And um, uh, before we kick kickstart the, the entire uh, chat, which I know that you're all dying to hear, I just wanted to uh, mention a few words uh, about Antler. So my name is Livia and uh, I'm an associate partner uh, and head of marketing here at Antler. We uh, build new companies. We both find and enable fantastic people who have the ambition, the drive and the hunger to build uh, worldwide companies. And we help them build these businesses from scratch as well as invest in the most promising teams. So we're a global platform. Stockholm is just one of 14 cities where we're present. Uh, so uh, basically we're uh, one of the world's largest early stage investment platforms. We support uh, or have to date supported more than 1,500 entrepreneurs globally. Every year, 50,000 people reach out to us uh, because they want to work with us in building their next venture. And so far we've invested in 250 companies globally. Nearly 50 of those are uh, here in, in Stockholm, Sweden. So uh, here's one example, the, the picture you saw with uh, Mar Maria Blosinska. She's the CEO and co-founder co of Unlock, one of our London-based portfolio companies. And uh, if we go to the next slide, what, what we're kind of doing that's, that's different from everyone else out there is that we noticed a gap in the market in those very, very early stages. So what we do is uh, we go in pre-seed uh, prior to uh, existing accelerators and incubators out there. And we help to select top entrepreneurs who have a proven track record, who have on average 10 years experience from building. And we help them to, to form strong teams in order to build companies that wouldn't have existed otherwise. So essentially our process uh, it consists of four main stages, you can say. First of all, we go out and source uh, really aspiring entrepreneurs around the world. Uh, we do a lot of outreach, but of course, we also get a, a fair amount of people um, from the world just who find us or who hear about us through the network or perhaps one of the entrepreneurs that we've worked with previously, a company that we've invested with, uh, et cetera. And um, then as they come into Antler to our platform, as mentioned, we help them to form really strong teams. We bring uh, the top three to 5% of applicants get selected to, to join us and, and build with us. And once the teams have been formed, uh, they pitch to, uh, to our investment committee after this ideation process, the validation process and the actual development process of their idea. And when they have this pitch ready, they pitch to our IC. And roughly speaking, we invest in, in around one third of the teams that have been formed. It's not a, a target number, uh, but usually lands up somewhere around there. And these are the most promising teams that have really, really sort of excelled uh, during this, uh, these first initial weeks, really shown a lot of strong progress, um, strength to execute. And we can see that they're really on a strong trajectory to, to build something with global impact, a product that users love. Um, after we invest in them, we, um, we help to continue, continuously launch and scale that business. They're a part of our, our network, obviously receiving weekly coaching, weekly advice, and, uh, and we can help bring in experts from various domains or with various um, uh, special knowledge from, from, the, um, from the global network. 
And during this growth phase, of course, we also support our portfolio companies in raising their next round. So making introductions to the right angels, investors, VCs, et cetera. And among the people that we work with, uh, it's a diverse group of founders. Uh, some examples, we have uh, Jenny Ann Axen Jonsson. She's the CEO of uh, fertility uh, startup Tilly. She used to be the CEO of an ed tech company. Uh, we have, for example, Umar Chogtai, who's a drones expert. He's now the CTO of Skycraft, um, also an, an expert within machine learning. And we also have uh, Nikhil Sharkana, uh, Sharkana, who's the CTO of Yalo. Uh, he's previously founded many businesses. He's a data engineer by trade and is building Yalo, which is helping e-commerce companies to handle their returns in a more data-driven way. And uh, I've mentioned our global advisory network, but uh, we have nearly 500 experts um, within tech, within entrepreneurship, within academia and business who are there to support your, your growth and scaling. And uh, just a few companies uh, I think that are worth mentioning uh, to give you a picture of uh, the type of companies uh, that, that are kind of coming out of Antler. I mentioned Umar, the CTO of Skycraft. Uh, so Skycraft, David Sakina and Umar, they met through our very first program in, uh, in the beginning of 2019. And they kind of joined forces based on their passion for, for sustainability and energy. And uh, David with his uh, technical leadership uh, background, Sakina with her experiencing from growth marketing uh, from, um, from startups and Umar with his knowledge of drones, this is how they came up with, uh, with the idea for Skycraft, actually combining artificial intelligence and drones in order to inspect infrastructure. So this really helps to reduce um, carbon emissions. It makes the process more safe instead of doing it uh, manually with, uh, with sort of helicopters flown over. And, uh, and they can also um, predict um, harms to the infrastructure system instead of uh, just kind of acting after the fact that say a tree has uh, has fallen over the um, over the power grid another example is um, Timico. Uh, they're building a virtual office platform and fun fact they actually started developing this prior to covid uh, so of course you know exceptionally great uh, timing with um, with everyone working from home these days and uh, it's a virtual office platform with walkie-talkie features. They have an integration to, um, uh, to both uh, Google Calendar and Slack. And uh, you can pin various documents so that you can co-work efficiently within Teamico, just like you would in your physical space. And I think our last um, example is, is Nag Studios, which is fitting since um, it's one of the gaming companies that we've invested in. So Peter and Yuan uh, joined uh, Antler uh, about a year ago, and uh, they both have experience and a true love for, um, for gaming. However, they didn't think that they were gonna build a gaming company. It just so happened that when they met, they realized, okay, you and me, we, we cannot do, we can't not build a gaming company based on, uh, based on our passion and uh, what we're trying to build. So, and I see that we have uh, you one here in the audience with us. So that's, uh, that's awesome. Extra welcome to you. So um, they're basically building a new way to experience um, competitive gaming. And uh, if you're interested, I think you should definitely reach out to you one Scott. Okay, but uh, really without further ado, um, oh, that's right. The last piece of information that I wanted to share from, from Antler's side is that we have a new cohort that's starting February 15th. Um, we've almost filled up all the spots, but we're always looking for exceptional individuals. So if you wanna build your, your company and uh, we keep on saying this, but we really believe that the timing has never been better than now. Uh, building something um, during crisis can be extremely, extremely beneficial because um, there's also a lot of capital out there um, looking to be invested into great technology solutions that, that actually better the world. But so we always have uh, extra spots left for, for people. So 
don't uh, don't be shy to apply or or recommend it to a friend. And uh, now, what you have all been waiting for? Uh, again, warm welcome, Christopher Kingdon. Really, really great to um, to have you with us. And uh, I want to start by asking you to introduce yourself. Right, I'll try. So, I'm a mostly Swedish but a little bit English and a tad Norwegian 53 year old man who was raised here in Stockholm. Uh, I'm married to a Finnish architect and together we have two Finnish, Swedish, English, Norwegian sons. And I, I also have a Swedish, English, Norwegian son since previous marriage. Uh, I studied at KTH uh, and at the Stockholm School of Economics. Um, and the first seven years of my career, I, I spent with Ericsson where I, after working in, in Sweden and Germany and USA, ended up being sort of an intrapreneur. This January was special. It marks the 20th anniversary of me taking the plunge into the startup world. And since then, I've been working with anything from a small startup to a, like a scale-up type company in a fairly large, uh, late stage. Uh, I've been part of five acquisitions during this time and a couple of failed projects too. Uh, and in December 2019, we listed AdventureBox at, at NASDAQ first uh, growth market, whatever it's called. Uh, uh, and me and my co-founder, Cleo, we'd been working on AdventureBox since May 2014. We've, had, we've worked full time with the company together. And, and AdventureBox is a company that makes it easy and fun for our users to make and share and play their own games. So we're sharing platform for consumer creative games. Great, thanks for that introduction. So, I mean, you obviously have um, a very, I would say long expertise with building startups, but I wanna hone in specifically a little bit on, on gaming. Uh, gaming's a, it's a dynamic industry. Changes are happening exceptionally fast. How uh, do you successfully start a business within, uh, within gaming? And what are your best tips for actually scaling? Yeah, well, I think starting businesses doesn't really matter if it's gaming or it's anything else. The, the one thing that the resource that's limited for all of us is time. Right? We, doesn't matter how much of everything we else we have, time is limited. So, so for me, when you start something, it's important what it is, you know, you should really have a reason, something you care about such that you will carry it through. Because spending years doing something that you then don't complete, I think, you know, it's, you can learn something perhaps, but to a great extent, it's a waste of time. Uh, you shouldn't waste time. So, so, so find the right thing to do. Uh, and then that thing that you think is important will give you the, the stamina and the passion to, to, to succeed. And the reason, I mean, that's, it's often like the business idea. That's, that's the reason. Um, it's what you want to improve about the world. Uh, and once you have that, you put everything else in place. The market is essentially the business idea. So that comes with that. The team, like you work with Antler, with, is really important. In my experience, you know, it's good to be two. One is too few, you need a friend. But three or four, it becomes difficult. Maybe can be handled, but 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 you know, to I think is the right amount, and and the mix we have for for tech companies, for gaming or other tech companies, I think is good. Where um, my co-founder is the tech wizard, and I do it. Well, I used to do everything else. I, you know, I think many founder teams I think are too big, and they lack the tech wizard. Uh, and if you're in a in a, a business where it's about delivering tech, if none of you is a tech person, you know, I doubt that you have the right founder team, pretty much. Uh, now, you, once you have your team, you, you get working. I, Steve Blank, the, the Berkeley professor, has written a long, difficult to read book that's really good called The Startup Owner's Manual. So, so I would read that book. It's all about small steps, lean startup, learn from users. At AdventureBox, we do uh, like two week sprints uh, and we measure a lot. And we do user interviews and service and usability tests. So it's, you know, one should also care really deeply about the users and, and, and the product. Uh, we built a strong board early on. 
used an accounting firm and a chartered accountant right from the start. It's, it's important to have the books in order, be prepared for that due diligence when it comes. Uh, uh, we, we added our advisory board quite late. An advisory board, uh, that's a good way of getting you know, connections and clever people to support you. Um, since we've come to this scale up phase, we've started with something called OKRs, Objectives and Key Results. It's a, a method for quarterly goals that Intel developed. So that's really you know, suitable when you're becoming a sl slightly larger organization to keep everyone heading in the right direction. So it's Measure What Matters is a good book about OKRs. Uh, and when you hire people, I should say, you should be extremely careful. So Elon Musk has a, a thing he says, which is um, quite harsh, but it's true. He says, whenever you fire someone, it's too late. I mean, hopefully you hire so well, so you don't have to fire people. But you know, if you have to, you should do it as early as possible. You, you need really competent people. You need people who care. Uh, so creating something new as you do with a, a startup is not for everyone. Lots of people want to have a much more comfortable life <laughs> than, than startups so offer. You have to be driven by the reason. Uh, uh, and, and then as a founder, I think you should always remember it's your company. They, they say a fish rots from the head for good and bad, right? Uh, uh, especially a startup is an extension of its founders. The, the values of the founders will be, become the values of, of the company. And you shouldn't be afraid of that. You shouldn't be shying away from, from, from that. This is your thing, essentially. Um, at Adventure Box, we work with these values. And it's always important, I think, to, to, to sp spell them out. So, so we say users, data, and diversity. And diversity for us means that our employees get to keep their individuality. So, so we're not enforcing sort of a narrow way of being at our company. Uh, and when it comes to data, someone said, I think it's someone at Spotify said, don't bring an opinion to a data discussion. Uh, and I think what they mean is that when you decide what to do, it shouldn't be the loudest voice that wins a shouting game about what you're doing. Everyone gets to bring their opinion and then you test it and, uh, and you see who was right. And it's often no one. It's something you everyone thought was the bad idea. That's the, the winning idea. But uh, and then, of course, users, the user value is obvious, right? We, what we do, we do for, for the users. So well, a, a few little tidbits there about- Lots of great tips. Yeah, so, so essentially make sure that you have a reason for why you're building something. Make sure that you're a team. You can't do it solo most likely, or it's harder, and you can't be too many because it gets uh, too mixed up. Uh, make sure that you focus on the user, you're user-centric and making something that they actually want. Uh, make sure that you have strong advisors around you and um, and be data driven. Those are some, I probably missed one or two, but I guess those are some of the um, great pieces of advice that you've given. But so, so I'm actually curious, uh, when you founded Adventure Box, what was your reason for building this company? So both me and my co-founder, Cleo Hayes McCoy, actually have similar backgrounds in a sense that we we both have engineering training. Uh, Cleo stuck with being a programmer and a mathematician while I want, went on to being interested in business later on in my career. But we have an engineering start. But then we both are amateur artists. So, so Cleo is a painter. She paints really well in oil. And I was always an amateur music musician. So I used to go to two high schools, one regular one and then the music high school. And, and so we were both interested in in creative work uh, and, and arriving at adventure box has been a very long process i often say i worked with time telecom internet media entertainment in that order you know starting at ericsson with a zeros and ones and then moving up through the the value chain to where they say content is king um and uh, i think when you use art yourself you realize that you know you, if you have a difficult time or you had a stressful day to sit down for 30 minutes by the piano and your problems melt away. It, it's, you know, sublimating your feelings into art is uh, one of the best things humans can do, right? You don't have to be aggravated. You don't have to start a fight. You put it 
uh, in the piano. Uh, and uh, when it comes to uh, computer games, you know, the biggest art form by far today, like three and a half times bigger than movies and I think 12 times bigger than music, most people who play computer games today are consumers. They, they cannot express themselves in their chosen art form, their favorite art form. So, so th you know, that hasn't changed. So that, that's where our passion comes from, our, our starting point. I really love that. Um, I love the analogy that, uh, that making games is, is a form of art and that one of your reasons for, for building this is to kind of um, inspire more people to, to use gaming as a form of uh, artistic expression. I think it's, uh, it's really great. But um, I'm, since we're talking about gaming, and I know that one of the uh, questions I think on, on everyone's minds here on the call is, in your opinion, uh, you're sort of, uh, you have obviously a lot of experience from building other startups, um, but now you're also six, seven years into, into building this um, online gaming platform. What have you seen have been the sort of biggest changes that have been going on in the gaming industry? And what do you think lies ahead? What's the future of gaming? Some of the things that happened over the last couple of years, one of them is streaming, streaming of games. Um, and the gaming space has been a quite protected space for many years. It was sort of niche. So big companies didn't really care about it. So uh, how should I say? Well, I shouldn't be mean, but, but people who, who didn't work for big companies and who like to play game, games, they, they could sit in their little companies and make games and, and be left alone pretty much. And, and some of these games, you know, they became hits. And over the years, the gaming space grew and these companies, many of them had a fairly easy ride to, to, to a good position, but, um, they were all driven, in a sense, by the art thing. They wanted to make good games. Uh, they didn't really care about selling them, or distributing them or anything like that. So, so selling and distributing computer games has been really complicated. It used to be you, you bought a CD and then companies like Steam came along and allowed you to download the games, but it's still gigabytes and it still takes forever. Uh, and it's really weird, right? Why would you make it so difficult to buy a product? And the main reason is they didn't care. They weren't interested in selling them. But so, so this uh, streaming revolution comes interestingly from Google and Amazon and Tencent, like big commercial companies who said, we can't do business like this. You know, if, if you have a user come to your website and you ask them to download something, 80% don't do that. You lose 80% of your potential customers. So I think that's a huge change that we just began to see happening. That games, just like music and video are today, will be streamed. Uh, but then there's lots of stuff going on. So, so one, of course, that we work with very much is, is consumer-created content, which is hugely impor important. And, and there are other art forms like music, uh, and video and writing, they're ahead of, of computer games in that. I think Chris Anderson wrote a book, it must be 15 years now ago, The Tipping Point or, or The Long, sorry, The Long Tail, it's called, uh, about um, what happened to the music industry with internet. I mean, it used to be that there was only that many albums available in the record store. And if you didn't make it onto the shelf of the record store, you had no chance of becoming a hit. And of course, now with Spotify and others, the shelf space is infinite and you have this long tail. And um, what Chris Anderson wrote was that in 2003, as music was concerned, that was the end of the consumer age, which I think is incredibly interesting. That was the year Britney Spears and Justin Timberlake had hits that made it onto the top 10 all time bestseller list has not happened since because uh, no one buys that much of any one album because you can listen to lots of different stuff. And he also said, by the way, that the consumer age for music started in the 50s with national radio in USA when everyone could listen to Elvis at the same time. And, and now we're back to where we were before that, you know, before national radio, if you wanted to hear music, you had to play the piano yourself. Um, 
and uh, with music now you have all these people sharing their own stuff uh, with, with writing it's fan fiction people writing their own stories and of course with video you have youtube and you have pewdiepie and all that and, and, and sort of that's what we're part of with adventure box and our users to make their own games but um, i can talk a lot about that but if, if we move on to other stuff then i mean the social aspect we, we have these social platforms today but most kids they don't really do facebook they're social inside the game they're chatting inside the game um, which makes sense and, and because when people say we spend too much time on our computers and our phones today you know it's just the beginning right the, the we all know facebook bought oculus and there's a reason they did that they understand that the this the mobile phone this is the last form factor i can show it there you go <laughs> that that's a, a mo looks like that we're not that far away from everyone wearing the the vr glasses all day i i used to you know wonder about the ar thing where when you with the google glass you projected things in, in the view and reality is so light strong uh, and the things you projected were light weak and they all always seemed like ghosts but in in the new oculus the, uh, they have the obvious solution right you look at reality through a camera so, so you both the reality and the things you project into reality are at equal terms you both see them through the screen so five to ten years everyone will be wearing these you know matrix style dark glasses and they will not be see-through they will not be glass they will have a camera and inside you will look at reality and you will look at your 3d environment and, and i think it was tim sweeney he's called the epic founder who said that you know in the future when we live in this vr world this metaverse as they say he said do you want facebook to own that world and uh, Facebook wants to own that world. You know, that's why they're selling the Oculus at, at a loss. They want to take that market. But to me, Zuckerberg being more, one of the more unreliable people out there, I wouldn't want him to own the world we're living in. Uh, so, so that's, you know, when we make games today, we're, we're creating 3D worlds in, in a future, which is not that far away, five, 10 years away. What we're doing is, is allowing you to control the world you live in so 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 being a consumer is always being to some extent a, a victim right you need to be a co-creator so much interesting stuff here to to pick up on and i'm not sure even where to start but so obviously you're you're saying that um i mean one of your kind of ideas here is to essentially put the um put the power back into the consumer by also allowing them to create video games and kind of be a part of i guess creating that meta universe that they want to see in the future and also you're speaking about the importance of of seeing social gaming or, or gaming is a new way of being social and it's not so new of course but it's um sort of the younger generation doesn't sort of distinguish between um being social uh, in a physical session and being social in, in an online game that perhaps older generations do and you're also talking about the the importance of ar and vr so my first question is is around um i guess individuals who um have never created a game before what do you think are the biggest um I guess biggest hindrances for them to actually start building a game and and connected to that do you see that most of your users are um sort of younger or do you have people from all age groups coming to your platform so our users uh, are a couple of years older than minecraft users uh, and the reason for that is that when you basically if you want to write dialogue you need to read and write so they start at about eight and uh, well, we have a few people in their 50s using it, but uh, I'd say to 25. So there's like a, a Poisson distribution where most of our users are 8 to 14. Uh, and in a sense, we talk about three user groups. Uh, the first one is kids who want to make games. And the other one is their parents who want their kids to be creative. But then the third user group is sort of the influencers, sort of pro individual pro game makers who uh, want an opportunity to earn 
from their game making, but also who, you know, like simple game making. So a friend of mine is a, a professional like AAA 3D model maker. And in her spare time, she's plays Minecraft because, you know, it's easier. It's sort of fun building rather than at work with sort of precise. So, so you can, uh, even as a professional game maker, you can play around with adventure box and make games. Um, now, if you're in a newbie at making games, if you're, you're starting out, then and that's something we work a lot with. Right now, we sort of have two game types that we support purposefully. And the simple one is a battle game, which is really simple to make. You just make a, an arena and off you go. And the other one is sort of the opposite. It's a role playing game with quests. And writing quests is like writing a story. So that becomes a creative challenge to, to write a, an interesting story. But what we're searching, what will be our sort of meme content? What type of games will really fly for us? And, and one thought we have is that it might be similar as it was in the indie game space in the beginning, like 20 years ago or 30 years ago, which was, you did, they call them demos, audiovisual experiences. So if you could make an audiovisual experience in Adventure Box, which is sort of a game, it's an interactive audiovisual experience, and you could share it, which you can then because it's streamed on, on Instagram or, or Twitch or YouTube or something like that. And then of course, people would watch the, the 2D version of the thing. And if they click the link, they would come to Adventure Box and then be inside it for the fully interactive experience. Uh, and something like that might be also easier to create. Could be like you're doing your own TikTok dance rather than having to do the full creative thing. And, and could you share some of your sort of, um, I guess, some of your learning so far uh, in the journey, now that you've, uh, you're a few years into building Adventure Box, what are a few things that you wish you had known um, back in the day? Oh, well, you, you know, it's good to be naive or, or you would never start, right? So I'm happy I didn't know everything when I started. Um, one thing I've learned is that building a 3D engine is sort of a big task. <laughs> Uh, and one could have maybe suspected that, but um, so we built our own 3D engine because it had to be easy to make games and it had to be in the browser to share, and that didn't exist. So we had to develop new tech. And then it's a lot of code. And if you do a lot of code, you'll, you will put bugs into it, right? So, so it's taking a long time to, to complete the 3D engine and to get it stable and bug free. Uh, and it, it was pretty good a couple of years ago. And we've been testing with users all the time, but over, over the last couple of years, we've intensified that. So it's, um, it's really been a, a process of focusing on the tech and uh, what you call them, you have, uh, I usually call it hygiene factors and X factors. And sometimes people call it delighters and detractors. So the detractors of course are, uh, you know, if it's buggy, if you don't understand what to do and all that stuff. So we've had a lot of focus on those things. And now we're moving into more and more the, the delighters. Uh, and therefore we're getting even closer with the users to, to really understand what is fun. Uh, uh, but so it's been a continuous learning, but, and also we, you know, over the years we've laid some people off and we've replaced them and we're growing the team now. And, and we have a fantastic team with people who are really motivated and really clever. And we didn't have all like that from the beginning. But at the same time, your project becomes more attractive over the years. So people that you couldn't maybe attract day one, year five, you can attract them. So it's a, it's a continuous learning experience, but it's, it's difficult to say that if we'd gone back and done it better, we could have succeeded better. Um, I, I would have had, well, maybe not even that, right? Because we, we, we struggled to have, get money all the time, like everyone does the first years. Uh, but in, if you don't have a lot of money, you can't make too expensive mistakes either. So maybe that's a, maybe it's a good thing, actually. Now, now lately we have more money and hopefully we're doing the right things now. We think we know what we should be doing. So yeah, you, you mentioned earlier that uh, about a year ago or before you were just over 10 people and, and now you're 20 people. Yeah. Um, what has sort of uh, 
enable that uh, that growth? And how are you um, how are you sort of uh, I guess keeping the adventure box culture intact while also trying to scale up and add more people to the team? Um, the, the basic thing was listing the company. So we used to do lots of little tiny seed rounds. And then a couple of years ago, with the help of Blas Holman Investment Group, we raised um, two plus one million euro. Uh, and uh, that was tied to a promise of listing the company, which we did. Uh, and then being a listed company and with our new chairman, Orion Fried, who had a relationship with the CEO of Pareto, uh, this autumn, with the help of Pareto, we were able to raise another 6 million euro. Uh, and for us, that's, we've raised 12 million euro in total throughout the, the history of the company. So, so 6 million euro was like doubling the total amount of money we've raised in, in one round. And actually, we asked for 5 million euro and we were offered almost 13 million euro. We couldn't accept more than 6 million. Uh, and so with that money, that means we can, uh, we can do things right <laughs> in the right order and we can lower risk. Uh, and so the first thing we did was uh, to build a bigger team and, and to add the competencies that, that we needed. Uh, and now we're in the middle of, uh, um, or almost the end phase of what we've been working on for the last couple of quarters is setting the plan for going forward really, while we're working on you know, current plans, we, we're thinking of, of how to succeed. So we, uh, uh, yeah, it, it, at this point, it really helps to have the money. And I mean, you were you were talking about sort of the the future of uh, essentially the future of life, really a, a bit before, but then on also the future of gaming. But I'm curious if anyone here on the call, for example, is considering building a startup of their own within this industry. What kind of um, opportunities do you think they should focus on or, or what kind of areas do you think are currently being overlooked oh, yeah well, that's interesting um well they could come talk with me right because we have this tech and, and you can use it for pretty much anything uh and um, we use it for games because we don't you know, but um we have an idea we could license it for other uses so you could you could use it for med tech or engineering, uh, or pretty much whatever. But of course, you, your question was if they wanted to do something in gaming specifically, and we're already doing that. Uh, so the trends in gaming, I talked about them a little bit. So, so the it's the social aspect of games, it's the consumer generated aspect, it's streaming, it's VR, AR, um, it's revenue sharing. Is huge right and of course some of these uh well, that, that's where elon musk's money comes from right he started the billing company first right uh, so, so i mean one challenge really is that you know paying out money to people across the world uh, and also dealing with all the you know paying vat and, and the taxes in the correct way all over the world it's fairly organized for the european union but when you go beyond that it becomes challenging. So, so I, maybe this whole, you know, the ecosystem of people creating and sharing content and being a facilitator in that space. I, 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 you know, I'm rambling on a bit, but I, someone said that if you went back to the, the 19th century and you spoke to a farmer and you tried to explain that you were a CIO for an IT company, it would be difficult, right? And I've got a feeling that a few years forward, it would be similar. If they came back to now because so many of the jobs we take for granted now won't exist and i think we'll have more influencers and we'll have more you know pe people who create uh, do creative things the, the culture sector will grow definitely services also catered to these uh, creators and influencers and, and in particular financial services like you're getting at yeah. um but i also uh, see that we are having a ton of great questions coming in from the audience actually and we only have about 20 more minutes so i would actually like to jump into uh, some of these questions yep. so uh the first question is uh about so you've mentioned sort of how you work with the, the user experience how you try to treat data and also diversity 
And uh, a question here is wondering, uh, what are the soft values in those values that you, um, I guess, that, that are important? Um, it depends what you mean with soft, but, but to me, in, in a sense, what's central producers and diversity or individuality is, is exactly that, right? That we care that each individual user can express themselves, who they are. And similarly then at our company, I think they used to say you can spot an IBM man from a mile or an IBM man plays tennis. And I remember he hearing, hearing a radio show where there was a CEO who said that she liked yoga and at her office, everyone did yoga. And I thought that sounded so horrible. You know, we're absolutely not like that. Um, so so it's, that, that's, it's maybe a soft value, but we, we, we're fierce about it. That, that we, we people are themselves and, and we really want them to stay that way. Of course, we have to meet each other when we communicate, but, but we, we really do not want to enforce a, a way of being. Thank you. And, and here's another question. Did you spend a lot of time prior to launching identifying different targets groups? And if so, did you get the results you expected post launch? Coming from a mostly physical context, it will be interesting to know how you work with user data to streamline and improve your online gaming business. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess, I mean, we're learning more all the time. So we assume that the people who play Minecraft and Roblox, which are, Minecraft is similar uh, and Roblox is a competitor, that they would also be our users. And that's, you know, essentially that's correct. But the, now we're, we're learning more about the different user types we have within that. Some people like to play, others are sort of casual makers, we have pro makers. So there's sort of divisions between, between, within our user groups. And the way we find that data is, well, we use a number of tools, of course, Google Analytics, and we have um, Delta DNA. Those are the systems we use most, but we have you know, three or four other systems as well. So we do a lot of measuring and analyzing of data, but, but then we speak with them as well. So we have reference groups, we, we do deep interviews, we do usability tests, uh, and, uh, and then they contact us, which is nice. So, so, so you know, we, we try to, to speak with them as much as possible. And we're doing this more, more and more, really. We will do it even more in the future. We, one ambition is that you know, we play and make games ourselves every week. We have a session with the team. We want to open those sessions up to our users so that we can play and make together to, to, to learn about the users. And, and a question here, which is related to the one you just responded to is, what would you say is the secret sauce in succeeding in reaching out to a potential customer base of your product, particularly for a gamer population? Yeah. Well, we want to, we want all our users to be creative, but and what, one easy way is to start with people who are creative already. Uh, and so one of the things that's fairly unique with what we do is we import file formats from other content creators. Uh, so there's, there's tools for designing with the 3D method we use called voxels, like Magica voxels and Cubicle. Uh, they, if you build something in those systems, you can import it to AdventureBox. And, and there's a lot of creative tools out there and people post what they did and it goes nowhere. But if they can import it to AdventureBox, then what they created can become a component in a game someone else makes. It's sort of more interesting. And, and that's a way for us to reach these creative people. Uh, we also import Google Maps. Uh, and of course we import Minecraft files. Uh, that's a bit of a challenge because they keep changing the file format, not that often, but a couple of times every year. So, so and they did a big change a couple of years ago. So, so we have to update our, our importer. But uh, that means that these uh, 100 million people who make Minecraft content, and, and that's a really active and creative community. They can import what they built in Minecraft to Adventure Box. And uh, so what is this like a static Lego building in, in Minecraft can become a, a dynamic game in Adventure Box. Thank you, Christopher. And, and here's another one. They're curious about 
How is AdventureBox monetizing? I noticed AdventureBox promotes two business area. Which one of them is bringing, uh, bringing in money or more money to the business? Is sharing platform and consumer game engine free for use and designed to attract users who will later apply for a license and consulting services? And do these services assume a membership fee? Yeah, I mean, we actually did one licensing deal where our tech was used on another platform, but that's a few years ago. So it saved some money at the time. Uh, when it comes to co the consumer business, we're modern, but we're not really innovating that much. We're doing what's done in the computer game space. So we, we have a freemium model. We show advertising to users before you play a free game, like before you see a YouTube video, you get to, to see advertising. And then we have a platform currency, Adventure Bucks, that you can buy with a credit card or with like a PayPal transaction. And with your Adventure Bucks, you can buy content on the platform. And we want to introduce, we have not yet, subscriptions. Uh, and, and with a subscription, you get a, like a, a weekly allowance of Adventure Bucks and you can get additional benefits. And the main idea is that if you have the $20 VIP subscription, you should have the right to... Uh, convert your platform currency that if you hold a lot of it to real currency. Uh, so, so those are the basic models. We, we're really focused on growth, but we're still developing the business models, mostly because they assist growth. They're part of the fun. It's fun to trade with adventure box. And if you can earn a revenue share, that's also motivating. But um, the revenue will come over time. So uh, you're in a growth and, and spending phase right now. Yeah, got it. Another question here is, uh, how do you compare gaming development to simulation development, where simulation software is one of the verticals that companies look into and try to make as real as possible in order to mimic real conditions? Yeah, well, the, the main thing with games, you know, in a sense, is that it's entertainment, it should be fun. So, so um, uh, you kind of especially professional game studios, they, I think they typically start there, like creative directors at the game studio. They try to think up fun stuff, interesting fun scenes. And I think if you're building a simulator, you come at it from a different direction. At Adventure Box, of course, we're not really a game studio. We're, we are a tools provider. Uh, and so for us, it's more we provide the functionality that a game maker needs to make a fun, a fun game. And of course, the, the 3D engine that we built uh, can then also be used for a simulation or for some other type of application. But, but uh, of course, that's, it's a major development work. So it would be something that would have to be done in like the sister company as a separate project. But so what you're kind of getting is, is that um, the definition of fun uh, should come from, from the creator, um, whether they want to create something um, sort of uh, more creative or imaginary versus more realistic. Yes, no, absolutely. Uh, and, and another question here is, uh, how do you keep up with the competition in your area? Are you watching them closely or do you try to run your own race? No, we watch them really carefully uh, and uh, and sort of we have a competitor analysis document that we keep up to date and one part of it is more like for an investor or used to be we don't we don't look for investors anymore but that was more to explain the gaming space you know how are we different from a minecraft or some other type of game but what we look more carefully at now are companies closely related to us the main competitor of course is roblox the, the big company uh, and so we look at what they what they do and what we can learn from them, what to do and what not to do and so forth. Um, um, we're, but we're not particularly afraid of competitors. And, and the reason for that is that, you know, if you're in the gaming space today, maybe not seven years ago when we started, but today it's fairly obvious that th there has to be a sharing platform for consumer creative games. And lots of people will try to, to create such a solution. And if they come from the gaming space, they might build something on top of Unity. So they can rather quickly create a prototype. But what we're interested in is we want to be YouTube for games, right? We want to be a mass market solution for 2 billion gamers around the world. Uh, and then it's about scalability. 
and about economics in scalability. And um, so, so to have a platform that allows it, uh, makes it possible to share easily with a one click streaming and makes it easy to create, that, that's really advanced technology. And the thing is, we've got a patent on it. Our patent is huge. It's like the Xerox patent. You know, Xerox used to have a patent on having a copying machine. Uh, and we have that. If, if you want to make it easy to make and share games, that's our patent. So yeah, we don't worry about competitors from that, that perspective. It, it, it's, you know, I hope they're successful and then they can license our patent. Thank you. And here's another one uh, more about sort of your experiences from the early days. How did your team manage to validate your MVP? Did your team in the early stages have any discussions regarding adding more functionality, optimizing the platform versus getting it out there? Yeah, we got it out really fast. I mean, I had actually read Steve Blank's book uh, about the Lean Stop Startup. Steve Blank was the chairman of, um, what's he called? Uh, the guy who wrote the Lean Startup book, IMU. He was the chairman of that company. Anyhow, so, so, so we started with the Lean Startup approach from day one. And, we started the company May 1st, 2014. And in August, we had our first alpha out. And this was mainly because Clear was such a fast programmer and she had a 3D motor already. And basically what she did, she put it in the browser. And then we had a, a group of course, Alpha Beta Testers. It's an online group of gamers who like to test out alpha products and, and 700 of them signed up. And we got lots of comments on, on the product. And then we did a Kickstarter. That was interesting too, because we, we launched a Kickstarter with what me and Cleo cared about, which was the, the game platform, but then we tagged the game along with it. So, so we, we presented the, the, the game platform as a, a mod tool for the game. And in the Kickstart, Kickstarter campaign, the only thing that got backing was the mod tool. The game didn't get any backing. So that sort of confirmed that people don't want yet another game they would want a game making platform. And all this happened within, you know, from May till December. Um, but so, so we've done a lot of like user testing in that sense and, and checking out our assumptions. But then of course, building this 3D engine was a lot of programming. So, so <laughs> you have to do that work in parallel. And uh, another question, uh, how are you currently working with marketing? Mm. We've changed marketing a lot. Like over the last couple of years, we wanted to know where we could find the right users and how we could do so cost effectively. And, and now we know, we know where the users are, we know how to reach them. Uh, and so what we're doing now is we've chosen to instead focus on, on a few selected users and to be extremely close at them. So at the moment, we're sort of, rather than minimizing our customer acquisition cost, we're maximizing it. <laughs> we're really investing in fewer users to get really close to them in, in, in this phase when we want to make sure everything is fun and, and works smoothly. So, so that means we're shifting our marketing from a more metrics driven industrial, how do we find user sheep to, to much closer relationships and working with forums and, and, and so forth. And uh, I guess a follow-up from, from me on that is how do you select which types of users you want to build that personal relationship with? Mm. Yeah, that's an iterative process and we're going through it all, all the time. Um, so we've had this starting general starting assumption about who they were, the, the kids, the, the pros and the parents. Yeah. And that is getting internally ever more granular with, with, with different types of, of user behavior. And uh, well, sometimes the users choose us, right? Uh, well, my favorite is an eight-year-old boy from Turkey who, uh, who writes to me on Messenger. Uh, so he actually has Facebook. Most of our users don't do Facebook, but he does Facebook. And uh, so, so he will write things. Well, I, I've spoken a lot to him, so he says, you know, he. He, he writes and reads and he's good at maths and he speaks mostly Turkish and he uses Google Translate to, uh, to, to translate them and then send me messenger messages. But, uh, you know, the, those users who really like you, they, they, 
they are difficult to ignore because they really track you down and they want to speak with you. I like that. Sometimes you don't get to choose, they, they choose you. Yeah. And um, another question, uh, earlier in the talk, you spoke, spoke very warmly about the importance of finding the right members um, to hire and getting them onto your team. So a question from the audience is, what's your secret sauce in selecting your team members? Yeah, um, well, so we have design, marketing and programming and we're programming heavy, that's half of company. So on programming, that it's surprising that if you add, put out an ad and you say you seek a programmer, Lots of the people who apply don't know how to program. You wouldn't think so, but that's true. Uh, and so what, what we've done is everyone gets to do a, a programming test. Uh, and so there are lots of online programming tests. So, so you, you should use one of those to hire a programmer to make sure they actually program before you hire them. And you might actually want to sh have them do it live while you look. So a, a friend of mine didn't do that. Uh, and but then he noticed that the candidate had taken code off of GitHub, and he could see the you know the text in in the code, so he didn't hire that person. Then later he he found you know he met the person who was now working for one of their customers, and he was wondering how could he work there because he couldn't program, and it turned out that he had two Indian guys working for him doing his job, so you know be really careful about making sure people actually know what they're doing. And uh, I think Swedes are often afraid of conflict and we're sort of polite and all that, but uh, yeah, you have to be careful about a hire and, and don't be too trusting and make sure that they're, I mean, if they're competent, they have passion too, because that's how you become competent. And uh, the last question that we have time uh, with from the audience is, are you expecting a boom in Twitch-based streaming services in the next year or two? For example, Streamlabs, Stream Elements, Restream, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Twitch will be huge for us, right? So what, what we want to do is that we want to have influencers of different kinds play Adventure Box and make games in Adventure Box together live on Twitch. And we want their fans to, to not only watch, but to send them a link and say, hi, Idol, could you please visit my world and build with me some? And then we want that to happen live, that this group of idols and influencers sort of click the link and they go hang out with their fans during a live Twitch. And uh, yeah, no, I, I think Twitch will continue to be huge. It will grow. It's part of this sort of live streamed world that, that we will live in. Thank you so much. And with just uh, one minute to go now, I, I want to say thank you so, so much, uh, Chris, for, for joining this. It was a pleasure to speak uh, with you. And um, I'm sure for, for any dedicated uh, game loving people out there, uh, maybe you can uh, get in touch with, um, with Christopher on, on LinkedIn. And uh, also just a, a final word from me is that I'd love to let you know that uh, with Antler, we've just opened an idea competition under the umbrella of Restart the Future. And so uh, this idea competition started this week and we'll be running it for the next uh, couple of months. So if you have an idea, uh, perhaps it's got something to do with gaming, uh, you should participate and compete in order to, to win um, a lot of great coaching sessions. You'll win a fast track application to Antler's program, uh, free pitch training, and also uh, the possibility to pitch in front of a jury um, and also then pitch at Antler's next demo day later this year. So go check it out on the website, uh, restartthefuture.com. And we can pop the, the link in. Yeah, it's in the chat already. Awesome. So thank you so much also to everyone at home for joining and uh, Pleasure to, uh, to see you. Take care. Have a great evening. Bye-bye. <laughs>